From the boiler rooms, Nortiel travels to a location where another battle was fought. Above this fatal wound in the ship lies Titanic's mailroom. Among the greatest heroes of, of Titanic's story, I think, are the postal workers. Mm -hmm. There were more than 3,500 bags of mail on board the ship. And as the uh, water began flooding this area, the men's only thought was to try to rescue the mail that they had been placed in charge of. As Titanic's mailroom floods, the postal workers drag the mail to higher ground. As they work, the rising water rapidly pursues them, lapping at their heels at each level. Eventually, they are overtaken. This great hole marks the spot where the five postal workers died. They were Titanic's first victims. The next sight is perhaps the most wrenching. From the control room, the crew guides Nortiel to one of the evacuation areas. Titanic's lifeboats were stored on her uppermost decks. There were only 16, capacity for about 1,000. This ghostly crane lowered boats into the dark sea. Second officer Charles Lightoller worked at this very spot. As Lightoller and his men crank out the boats, passengers stand by and watch. Among them, there is utter disbelief. Nothing seems wrong. Why are they being asked to evacuate? Many passengers initially won't leave, and the first boats are launched virtually empty. Near this location, the radio operators frantically signal for assistance. In a desperate attempt to summon help, they send a newly adopted distress code, SOS. Titanic is one of the first ships in history to send the call. What we are looking at now is the uh, interior of the ship's wireless room. Here, the radio operators, uh, Jack Phillips, and Harold Bride were given the information that the Titanic was doomed. They began immediately sending out distress signals. And so it was from this very room that these, these two men worked very hard to save lives. Recognizing the fatal damage to Titanic, designer Thomas Andrews calmly works to prepare the passengers for the lifeboats. He knows, regardless of his effort, there will be a tragic loss of life. Third-class passengers August Wennerstrom and the Lindells are left on their own. As they head for the lifeboats, the stern begins to rise out of the water. We saw the sea climbing up the deck more quickly than before. I could see that everyone was clamoring aft and trying to keep from sliding down the slanting deck, which was growing steeper. Third-class passenger August Wernerstrom.
Deep in the belly of the ship, Frederick Barrett and the crew fear the red hot boilers will explode when they come in contact with the icy seawater, so they extinguish the boilers. As each fire is put out, the hold fills with steam. Blinded by black dust and steam, one of Barrett's companions falls into an open manhole. His leg is shattered and Barrett drags him to a pump room. Nearly two hours after impact, a weakened wall caves in and the sinking of Titanic accelerates. Barrett escapes, but his companion will perish. When Barrett arrives on deck, his timing is perfect. He is quickly assigned to a lifeboat as an oarsman and is lowered away. Lawrence Beasley climbs aboard Barrett's boat when no more women or children are nearby. On the opposite side of the ship, one man wrestles with his conscience. His name is Masabumi Hasono. I tried to prepare myself for the last moment, making up my mind not to leave anything disgraceful as a Japanese, but I still found myself looking for any possible chance for survival. There were many men who attempted to squeeze in, but sailors refused them at gunpoint. I myself was deep in desolate thought. Even if I became the target of a pistol shot, it would be the same. And thus, I made a jump for the lifeboat. From the dark sea, Hasono looks back at embattled Titanic, her lights burning brightly, her stern rising perversely from the water. I saw a great number of passengers still frantically moving about on the deck, giving terrible shouts and cries for help. The scene was just horrible and eerie. Our lifeboat too was filled with sobbing and weeping women who had been worried about the safety of their husbands and fathers. It was all unbearably sad and hopeless. On board Titanic, Mrs. Ryerson refuses to leave her husband despite his best efforts to convince her otherwise. My husband said, when they say women and children first, you must go. And I said, why do I have to go on that boat? And he said, you must obey the captain's orders and I'll get in somehow. First class passenger, Mrs. Emily Ryerson. Hundreds of families are struggling with the same question. Should they separate? or stick together. With few lifeboats left, people take the threat of sinking seriously. challenge for the crew is to keep people from mobbing the remaining boats. 